the traditional internet model is a best effort internet model in which uh, the network makes every attempt to transmit the packet but does not offer any explicit quality of service guarantees in terms of delay bandwidth or delay jitter. Now this model was considered quite adequate for most non real time applications which are prevalent on the internet like for example telnet or file transfer or web browsing, uh, email, these kind of applications. Now these kind of applications uh, uh, truly speaking do not require any hard guarantees in terms of uh, delay or delay jitter. They can tolerate uh, some amount of delays. But when broadband multimedia real time applications uh, started uh, their way into the internet in terms of either video conferencing or internet telephony and voice over IP applications, it was felt that these kind of applications require explicit quality of service guarantees in terms of either minimum bandwidth or delay and delay jitter. So therefore, you know, the Internet Engineering Task Force IETF started working on a new group to develop a framework for, the ser for defining the services and service model and at the same time an architecture for an internet which can give quality of service uh, guarantees. Now that model was called integrated services internet model. Uh, we will see today uh, in this lecture the salient architectural features and motivations for this new integrated services uh, internet model. Unfortunately uh, the paradigm of the integrated services internet model was to give quality of service guarantees at the individual applications flow level and later on after the architecture and the service model was formulated it was discovered in the real life or in practice that it is not possible to give explicit end to end quality of service guarantees to individual applications and flows primarily because large number of states uh, corresponding to each application flow will have to be maintained in the intermediate nodes and routers and clearly it is not possible to maintain such large number of states for such large number of applications. So uh, to address that problem therefore a uh, new architectural framework to provide quality of service guarantees at a coarser granularity was proposed and that was called differentiated services framework. We will also study you know later on these differentiated services framework. So on the one spectrum of quality of service guarantees we have best effort internet model which does not offer any quality of service guarantees and on the other spectrum of the QoS we have integrated services internet model which gives quality of service guarantees at a very fine granularity. In between you know the internet has come out with a new paradigm or a new framework which as I just told that is called as differentiated services framework. It is the differentiated services framework which is likely to be more popular in providing quality of service guarantees and bandwidth provisioning uh, in the uh, present day internet. We will see the features of differentiated services later but first let us look at the model which was proposed uh, to provide explicit quality of service guarantees in the internet at the individual application flow level which is called as the integrated services internet model. So this is an integrated services internet model. Uh, now this uh, internet service model has been specified in the IETF's RFC which is uh, 1633. Now the key assumptions uh, in this uh, INSERV popularly uh, called INSERV the key assumptions are that resources have to be explicitly managed the resources must be explicitly managed and these resources must be explicitly managed through a combination of resource reservation and admission control. So what must happen is that, that each individual application flow must specify its resource requirements and then the network must determine through an admission control whether the call can be accepted or not, the, whether the required or requested quality of service guarantees can be met or not. If it can be met then the flow will be admitted. And then later on a flow specific state is required to be maintained 
in the routers. So, these are the key assumptions uh, of uh, this service model. Okay. Now, as we have just said that since uh, the integrated services internet model requires resource reservation and admission control, obviously each flow must specify its service requirements. Okay. And uh, after the source has specified its service requirements and its traffic characteristics, uh, the network will make certain service commitments. Okay. So, the network then will then have to make service commitment. Now, these requirements and commitments can be made either at the individual flow levels okay, uh, at the application level and therefore, the service requirements needs to be specified in terms of application level performance or they can also be made at the granularities of classes of flows or entities okay, and which is actually the performance has to be judged in terms of the resource sharings. So, the INSER model will allow both at the individual application flow level or at the entities level. Okay. Uh, note you know as I was just mentioning that the, uh, the coarser granularity is available more at the differentiated services framework, but as you will see later on that the entire paradigm of providing quality of service guarantees is completely different in the differentiated services framework. So, when we say that the resource management at the entities level will take place in the INSERV, the INSERV has two basic features. One, it operates on an end to end level. So, therefore, all the intermediate nodes in the network must provide pro quality of service guarantee because it operates on an end to end level. And secondly, the INSER model gives end to end quality of service. So, it defines actually an end to end service. As opposed to that, we will see in the differentiated services framework, it does not offer any end to end quality of service guarantees, it may give only in certain domains in between. So, so that is uh, uh, that is one thing. Second thing is that we will see later on that the differentiated services network does not define any service model, it only defines forwarding treatment. So, there are the two you know fundamental differences between the INSER model and the differentiated services model. Although popularly uh, it is told that in the integrated services internet model, you have to give quality of service guarantees at the individual flow level and at the differentiated services framework, you have to give quality of service guarantees on the aggregates of flows. So, while that is true, you know, but at the same time, you must keep in mind that in the INSER model, you can also aggregate some application flows into one bigger flow between two customers and can give end to end quality of service guarantees by maintaining this aggregate flow specific states in each individual router along the path. Now, even though you are not giving quality of service guarantees at the application flow level, you are giving at aggregate flow level, it would still be defined within the framework of the insert. All right. Now, let us look at uh, uh, what are the service requirements that could occur for the individual flows. Okay. Now, obviously, the service requirements for the individual flows will be in terms of per packet delay. The packet delay is one of the most important criteria for real time multimedia application flow, which is the primary motivating factor for defining the in serve architectures. Now, this per packet delay usually you would require a bound on the maximum uh, and the minimum delay. Uh, typically, uh, you will not require guarantees in terms of average packet delay. You will require guarantees in terms of worst case delays because you know essentially these are real time applications. Then you may require uh, guarantees in terms of what is the minimum bandwidth that can be given and what is the sustained bandwidth you know that is available. The third service requirements for an individual flow can be in terms of the packet loss probability. Uh, though the uh, real time application flows are somewhat insensitive to packet loss in the sense that they can tolerate some 10 to 20 percent of the uh, uh, you know uh, packet loss depending upon the per in particular applications. Okay. But even then you know uh, different application flows depending upon their applications requirements may have different requirements in terms of the packet losses. Now, 
all the flows uh, in the insert model can be defined in therefore two types one is the real time applications and another one is the elastic applications now insert model was really architected to take care of these real time applications the elastic applications were actually the applications running within the best effort service model they are not so much sensitive to packet delays and the bandwidths although they may be uh, sensitive to the packet loss probabilities so so therefore they have an inbuilt mechanism for the retransmission of the packets if some packets are lost uh, so so even if the packet arrives late the applications can still make use of it okay so the, though even though they may be sensitive to somewhat packet loss but that is addressed by having uh, an inbuilt retransmission mechanism so now let us look at first at the real time applications you know what kind of real time applications uh, we are uh, talking now in the insert model uh, we consider only a playback kind of real time applications to understand uh, what is the playback real time applications let me just explain you know what is meant by a playback real time applications now typically what happens let us say that this is a uh, voice uh, over internet kind of applications so in the voice over internet let us say that you digitize the voice so you have an analog to digital conversion and then you packetize the voice packetize it and send it over the internet now this is your receiver where you will play the packets now what happens at at the at the source you know the packets there may be certain periodicity with which the packets might have been generated so let us say that these are the samples you know which have been generated at the transmitter so this is at the at the transmitter so at this end now in the internet each packet may suffer certain delays but what is more important is that a different packets may suffer different delay so therefore this packet may arrive here and this packet may arrive here and this packet may arrive only here and then this packet may arrive here and the fourth packet may arrive here now as you can see here that the periodicity with which the packets were generated at the transmitter that periodicity has been completely lost at the receiver so if these packets are given to the receiver for play out okay obviously there will be a distortion in the speech okay what is that? why this is happening this is happening because different packets are experiencing different delays okay while it is true that depending upon the applications of voice these voice applications can tolerate some amount of delays but what is more significant here is that different packets are encountering different delays that is what is called as delay jitter okay now typically depending upon the applications the amount of delays that can be tolerated can vary from 300 milliseconds to you know 150 millisecond actually the human ear cannot perceive delays less than 150 milliseconds any amount of delays from 150 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds may be tolerable depending upon applications let us say for example you are having a streaming audio over the internet from an internet from an audio server then some amount of delays can be tolerated maybe up to 300 milliseconds but if you are having a two way interactive telephone conversation over the internet then obviously the amount of delay that can be tolerated will have to be less so it depends really upon the application what is the maximum amount of delay that can be tolerated but even if you assume that the maximum delay that can be tolerated is less than the permissible limit what is really happening here as we have seen that because different packets are encountering 
different delays okay there may still be a perceptible degradation in the speech quality so what is the solution the solution is that at the receiver we use a playback buffer so at the receiver we use a playback buffer so we buffer the packets okay and then we play out the packets at an appropriate time interval such that the periodicity with which the packets like here you know the periodicity with which the packets were generated at the transmitter that periodicity is maintained to again explain this fact something like this that let us say the packets were generated at this so this is like a time and this is like a sequence number of packet so so this is one packet has been generated second packet has been generated third packet has been generated so on right however these packets arrive differently so this packet arrives uh, here this packet arrives here this packet arrives here and this packet arrives here so as a result the arrival times are now what you do is that you start playing the packets from at from at this point so the first packet is played here second packet is played here third packet is played here and the fourth packet is played here so is as you can see that this packet which arrived here had to wait in the buffer for this much amount of time and then then it was played out here this packet which arrived here since it suffered the maximum delay didn't have to wait in this playback buffer it is played out immediately this packet which suffered some what less delay it waits in the buffer for some amount of time and then it is played out here similarly this packet which suffered this amount of delay it waits for certain amount of time now what you can do is that if you can adjust the playback time in such a manner that even those packets which suffers the maximum delay they can also be accounted for okay then you know we are done we can then appropriately delay the packets in the playback buffers and then play them out as a result there will not be any packet loss but there will be some latencies in playing out the first packet now this latency will depend upon what is the maximum delay that is there in the network now if the network can bound this maximum delay then we can reduce that latency right just to give you an, an uh, you know a complete flavor let us say that ti is the time of generation of the packet ith packet so the time of generation of ith packet and ri is the time of arrival at the receiver right the time at which the packet will be played out that is pi the time at which this ith packet will be played out pi will clearly be equal to ti that is the time at which it was generated plus d max where d max happens to be the maximum delay note that this packet delay actual delay has been di has been equal to ri ri is the time at which it was received and ti is the time at which it was transmitted so ri minus ti is actually the delay okay so the packet has to wait in the playback buffer for an amount of time so this is you know d buffer the delay in the buffer is actually equal to d max minus di so for this much amount of time you know the packet has to actually wait in the buffer so so this would be uh, so if the minimum packet delay is some d min then the amount of time for which the packet has to wait in the buffer is equal to d max minus d min that is the maximum amount of time so therefore 
each packet has to wait in the buffer equal to the delay jitter that is the difference between the maximum and the minimum delay. If we can reduce this delay jitter that means if we can bound the D max okay, then we can also reduce the latency. Now such applications are called the playback applications. In the end serve paradigm only the playback real time applications have been considered for you know defining the framework or the architectural constraints. Now we now go back to the real time applications of our discussion here we consider only as we have just discussing playback real time applications. Now as we just saw performance of playback applications is determined by two factors one is the latency. So as we have just talked that applications like two way interactive phone call they are actually more sensitive to the latency. Now if we play out some packets okay if we uh, reduce the play out if we reduce the time for which a packet has to wait in the buffer then it may and if we do not really worry about that uh, d max that is we do not compute the playback time for each packet to be t i plus d max but some other time that is p i is equal to t i per let us say some d average delay then it may so happen that some packets whose you know delay may be greater than the t d average okay they may arrive after their playback time has passed and as a result those packets cannot be played out and will be considered as lost. Because of these packet losses which will happen at the receiver there will be certain loss in the speech quality or, uh, or fidelity. Now real time applications they really exhibit wide range of sensitivity to the fidelity. Okay. Some applications can tolerate uh, more packet losses, some applications can tolerate less packet losses. So depending upon that we can define the real time applications into two types either they can be a tolerant real time applications that means they can tolerate some loss of fidelity or they can be an intolerant real time applications real time applications which cannot tolerate any packet loss or loss of fidelity. So, however remember that both these applications that is tolerant and intolerant applications are the playback applications that means their packets can be buffered in the playback buffer and then can be played out. If any packet arrives after its playback time has expired then that packet will be considered as lost in both tolerant and intolerant applications. But tolerant applications can tolerate somewhat more packet loss and intolerant applications can tolerate very less packet loss. So as you can see therefore that we need to construct different service models to take care of tolerant and intolerant playback real time applications. Now as you can see in the intolerant applications that means if you cannot tolerate any packet loss okay, in your playback delay. So if your situation is as I was just discussing here if you cannot tolerate any packet loss here then it is necessary okay, that you need to put your playback time in such a manner that it takes care of the maximum delay that is you know you have to every packet you have to make it t i plus d max. Okay. So we can achieve here as by saying like this that it intolerant application fixed offset delay can be larger than the absolute maximum delay. Now if you do this and if you have to reduce the latency then in order to reduce the latency you need a perfectly reliable upper bound on the delay. So in order to reduce the latent sorry in order to uh, have no packet loss and in order to fix an offset larger than the absolute maximum delay we need to know perfectly what is this absolute maximum delay and therefore we need a perfectly reliable upper bound on the delay. And also of course to reduce the latency this bound has to be uh, less. Now a framework a service framework which provides a upper bound on the delay okay, is called guaranteed services within the INSER framework model. 
Now, tolerant application in case of tolerant application. Now, note that tolerant applications are those applications which can tolerate some packet losses. Okay. Now, in this case, the fixed offset delay need not be larger than the absolute maximum delay. What does it mean? You don't have to. You don't have to fix. You don't have to fix the playback delay as T i plus D max every time. You can adjust the playback delay for every application's T i by some d hat where, where this d hat will be computed separately. It may so happen then some packet r i, some ith packet may arrive at time r i, which turns out to be greater than p i so computed. So, if the packet arrives later than its playback time, then that packet will be considered as lost and therefore, there will be some fidelity loss. However, since these are tolerant applications and they can tolerate some packet losses. Okay. What is now more important therefore, is to adjust this d hat, this d hat here in such a manner that a large proportion of the packets okay, are able to arrive before their playback time has expired and therefore, they can be played out okay, to absorb the delay jitter. So, the fact is therefore, that we do not require a perfect reliable upper bound on the maximum delay that is possible in the network. We require only somewhat loose guarantees. Okay. Now, that model we will call it to be a control load service model which can be applied for tolerant applications. So, two models actually speaking in in integrated services when, when this integrated services internet framework was architected, several service models were debated and considered and finally, the INSERV came to conclusion of defining paradigms or frameworks for two service models. One is the guaranteed service model and another one is the control load service model. So, guaranteed service model is meant for intolerant applications which requires a perfectly reliable upper bound on the maximum delay and control load service model is meant for tolerant applications which exhibits less sensitivity to the packet losses. They can tolerate some packet loss and therefore, they do not require a hard perfectly hard guarantee or perfectly reliable upper bound on the worst case delays. Okay. So, let us see what is the guaranteed service model meant for intolerant applications. Since you require a perfectly reliable upper bound on the delay obviously, it is based on worst case assumption of the flows. Okay. So, here you need to assume okay, since you do not you do not want any packet loss okay, and since you want that a, a guarantee on the delay you have to assume the worst case scenarios for the flows. On the other hand in the control load model which is actually meant for tolerant applications the bound is not based on the worst case assumption of the flows. Control load model actually emulate some kind of a lightly loaded network. Okay. Typically, this model can be implemented by using some kind of a weighted fair queuing scheduling algorithm that we have discussed in combination with an admission control mechanism. So, what you can do is that the services or the application the flows or the applications which have subscribed for the control load model, they can be given a little bit higher weight in the weighted fair queuing model right? and therefore, they will get certain priorities over the other users. And to limit the amount of such flows, you can employ admission control. So, that you do not admit large number of such flows otherwise you know even though they have been given higher weights in the weighted fair queuing, individual application flows will end up seeing you know a congested network. So, so what you do really is that you give them higher weights, but you control the amount of traffic that they are injecting through some kind of re traffic regulation or admission control. Okay. So, by through admission control. Uh, so, if you do that then these applications for these applications it will appear as if the network is lightly loaded. Now, tolerant applications therefore, the, 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 the thesis the premises is that the premise of the thesis is that most of these applications will behave properly and very well 
if the network is lightly loaded. So therefore, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to emulate a lightly loaded networks. All right. So the calculations are therefore not based on the worst case scenarios of the flows. As a matter of fact, the model is motivated by the conjecture that the performance penalty for our applications will be small compared to the gain that you will obtain in network utilizations through statistical multiplexing. Okay? Uh, because what will happen clearly that in guaranteed service model, we want hard guarantees uh, in terms of the worst case delays and therefore your admission control is based upon the worst case assumption of the flows. You are the, your statistical multiplexing gain is clearly very low in the guaranteed service model. Maybe you have to admit flows based on peak rates. But in the control load uh, model, in the control load model, since you can, you are not admitting based on worst case, your statistical multiplexing gain may be little bit, you know, higher. You can of course augment this service model. It has been actually found that many audio and video applications can actually adjust the data rate. Okay. So they can be rate adaptive applications also. For example, they can use some kind of rate control schemes in MPEG codings. Okay. Uh, so depending upon the congestion conditions in the networks, the network can actually notify to change their traffic characteristics and uh, the rate adaptive applications can change not only their playback point but also the traffic pattern. So this is like a, uh, so what we are saying is that you have two types of applications tolerant and intolerant. Okay? Now the tolerant applications are actually delay adaptive. The delay adaptive is that you can adjust the playback point. Okay? depending upon the network delays that you are observing. Okay? So you can periodically adjust the playback point. Of course, by periodically adjusting the playback point, there is a possibility that some packet losses will occur because some packets will arrive after their playback point has expired. But your applications are not so sensitive to you know, a small packet loss. Okay? So these are delay adaptive applications. You can also have, a, apart from delay adaptive, you can also have a rate adaptive applications where say by changing the quantization level in your MPEG encoders, you can actually change your data rate. So if you observe the congestion conditions in the networks, you can reduce your data rate by making the quantization a little coarser. Okay. So, so these are, you know, so therefore there can be an, another service model which also takes care of the delay adaptive applications. The second applications that we were talking is the best effort applications also called as elastic applications. Here you know the, the thesis is that it uses the arriving data immediately rather than you know buffering it in the playback buffer. Okay. And it will always wait to, it will always choose to wait for the incoming data. So if the some packets have been lost, then it can wait for the retransmitted packet to arrive. There is no hurry to play that packet out. And more importantly, while in the case of real time application, the performance depends on the worst case bound or delay. Here the performance depends more on the, you know, average delay, okay, than on the tail of the delay distributions. So really speaking, the kind of guarantees which elastic applications will require is that the average delay, you know, should be lower than the permissible limits. Okay. So as long as the queues in the network or queues in the routers are less than certain or always maintained less than certain permissible limits, your average delay will be lower and therefore the elastic applications will perceive a good performance. Okay. So the whole idea is, is really to reduce the average delays of the packets for the elastic applications and that you can do by reducing the average queuing delays and that can be done by actually reducing the congestion conditions in the network. Now even elastic applications actually differ in their requirements for the average delays if you really see. 
There are three kinds of elastic applications that we can talk. One is the interactive burst, which are like applications like Telnet or NFS kind of thing. Then interactive bulk, which are like FTP applications. And then asynchronous bulk, which are email or fax over IP, those kind of applications. So if you really see among these three kinds of elastic applications, it is the interactive burst, really speaking, which requires you know, the least average delays. And then interactive bulk may tolerate more average delay than the interactive burst. And asynchronous bulk can actually tolerate a much higher amount of average delay. So really, in terms of their average delay requirements also, these you know, elastic applications differ. And one can, uh, one can you know, give bandwidth guarantees or delay guarantees for these applications by using some kind of packet scheduling algorithms and put applications like Telnet and uh, NFS kind of applications into different queues with the higher weights and put applications like asynchronous bulk with the lower weights. Okay. So by using appropriate packet scheduling algorithms at the routers, it is possible to guarantee these kind of average packet delay. No, though for elastic applications, no hard guarantees are required. Only qualitative guarantees are really required in the INSER model. In the INSER model, really speaking, the hard measurable quality of service guarantees are given only to the guaranteed service traffic. So, this service model for elastic applications is really what is called as ASAP, as soon as possible service model. And as we have just discussing, there are three delay classes. Interactive burst requires lower delay than interactive bulk, and the interactive bulk requires lower delay than asynchronous bulk. Asynchronous bulk can tolerate a uh, much higher amount of average delays, and these are the applications like email and so on. Now this is, we were talking uh, at the individual uh, applications flow level. It is also possible, so, so as far as the individual applications flows are concerned, their quality of service attributes are specified in terms of per packet delay or bound on the maximum and the minimum delays. Okay. So the delay is one of the most important quantity there and most of these applications are playback applications. Now we can talk of when we talk of giving end to end quality of service guarantees under the INSERF paradigm for the classes of flows or the aggregates or at the entity level, the service commitments and service requirements are of different types. So the service requirements for entities will be more in terms of aggregate bandwidth on the individual links. Okay, that is what they will be talking. And these links, so different entities could be there, for example, these the, uh, these links, the bandwidth may be shared among multiple entities or multiple organizations or you may allocate bandwidth depending upon various protocols like for example the IPv4 traffic or IPv6 traffic and, and so on or you may allocate it depending upon you know different services. So you can have a multi-service uh, sharing as well. Uh, so, so this brings so what we have specified right now is the requirements of the services both from individual application flow point of view and from uh, entities uh, point of view. Now as you are saying that the paradigm or the framework of the integrated services internet model is that the resources have to be explicitly managed whether they are individual application flows or whether they are the entities. So it requires therefore a resource reservation model and the resource reservation model which has been specified in RFC 1633 is that each individual flow will specify its traffic characteristics and the desired quality of service attributes. The traffic characteristics will be specified in the form of a token bucket filter. We have already studied the token bucket filter. The token bucket filter is specified by two parameters. One is a token generation rate R and second the bucket depth B. So each flow has to specify its characteristics through R and B, okay, which is what is called as T specs or the traffic specifications. And it has to specify its quality of service characteristics or reservation characteristics 
through reservation specs which is called as R specs. Now, uh, like in the telecom networks, before you can actually start transmitting the data, you have to establish a call. In the INSER model also, before you can start transmitting the data, you have to undergo a signaling procedure. Note that in the best effort internet model, there was no need for signaling, there was no signaling. The model, the delivery model was actually a connectionless datagram delivery model. Now here, however, you have to undergo a signaling procedure, just like in the broadband ATM network. Here also, you will have to undergo a signaling procedure. And that signaling in the INSER model is called resource reservation protocol or RSVP. We will see shortly what are the attributes or features of the signaling protocol and how this signaling protocol is distinct or different from the QoS signaling that is done in networks like ATM or packets or circuit switch networks. And then once the uh, T specs that is the traffic specifications and the reservation specifications are specified through RSVP, the network undergoes an admission control algorithm and which could be measurement based and determines whether the flow can be admitted or not. And once the flow is admitted, a virtual circuit is set up between the source and the destinations on an end to end basis and then the flow can start transmitting the packets. Since the INSERV defines an end to end service model, a virtual circuit needs to be established for each individual application flow on an end to end basis. And that is the primary reason why a flow specific state is required to be maintained in each individual routers leading to a leading to maintenance of large number of states in the routers. So, the traffic control mechanisms that are used. So, up, so one is as we had discussed, we require a signaling protocol and admission control mechanism. Then we also require individual traffic control mechanisms in the INSERV routers. One of the important mechanisms is packet scheduling algorithms. We have already discussed these packet scheduling algorithms. Some of the popular packet scheduling algorithms which are used to provide quality of service guarantees is weighted fair queuing algorithm. We know that a bound on the worst case delays in the case of weighted fair queuing algorithms can be given if the traffic is token bucket regulated or rho sigma regulated. We can give guarantees by using weighted fair queuing in terms of the worst case delay bound. Now, therefore, it is you know these weighted fair queuing kind of algorithms have been the primary implementation mechanisms for the QoS routers. We have to also take into account how we will drop the packets. We have to determine for example, that by dropping the packets the service objectives are, are not violated. Okay. So, therefore, the applications like real time applications which exhibit lot of sensitivity to packet loss or fidelity loss, we have to sort of take care that their packets are not lost. Unfortunately, the length of the queue is not an indication of how long the packets are there in the queue. It is not an indication of the congestion conditions in the networks. You have to take a decision on dropping the packets based on some long term average of the queues. So, therefore, algorithms like weighted RED or RED, random early detections, they have to be sort of used. We had already discussed both you know the packet dropping algorithms and the packet scheduling algorithms in our previous discussions. Okay. And the third important component of a QoS router is packet classification. Packet classification will look at the attributes of the packets and then will classify the packets appropriately into individual flows which can then be queued. Okay. So, if you really see the model of a QoS router, it will be look something like this. So, there is a, a control plane and there is a 
data plane. So in control plane you have routing agent. and you have admission control and admission control and signaling like RSVP. These are all elements the control planes. Now when the packet comes at the input, the packet goes through a classifier, classifier and classifier then puts the packets into individual application flows and then you go for packet scheduler. So the admission control will configure the packet scheduler and also you know the rule base will configure the packet scheduler, you know, the classification rule engine. There you need to define what is the definition of your, your flow. Your flow could be based upon a pure application or the flow could be an entity. If the flow is an entity, then the packet classifier will look at the source IP address only and all the packets which bears the source IP address of this particular entity, they will be put into one flow. If you are looking at an individual TCP application, then you will look at the source IP address, destination IP address, source port number, destination port number. This will identify a particular TCP flow and you will classify the packet into a particular TCP flow. So you will put them into different queues. So actually you will look at the packet attributes and depending upon how your packet classifier has been configured through a rule engine, you will classify the packets into individual flows. Before actually you do this in the data plane as we have already discussed that before any source can start transmitting its packet, it has to send the signaling RSVP signaling messages which contains the traffic specifications and the reservation specifications. The admission control through an admission control algorithm will determine whether the flow can be accepted or not. And if the flow can be accepted, then the admission control algorithm will configure the scheduler accordingly, set up the virtual circuit path and then allow the flow to start transmitting the packets. So when the packet comes, the now the packets pass through the data plane, these are the data packets. Therefore, they will undergo the packet classification, scheduling and switching. Okay. So these are the three primary engines in the data plane of any particular router. Okay. Now what we will do now in the next is to understand how the signaling for the call setup takes place in the INSER paradigm which is what is called as the resource reservation protocol or RSVP. Okay. Uh, as far as this individual implementation mechanisms like packet scheduling or classifications or various admission control algorithms or token bucket regulations, we have already discussed these individual components earlier in our previous lectures. We will now you know discuss the resource reservation protocol and that will complete our framework, our description of the framework for the ints or model. We will then see you know what are the difficulties or challenges that were there in with this INTS or model for their practical implementations and therefore another model to provide quality of service guarantees at the course granularity level that is the differentiated services framework was proposed. So with this we will uh, conclude uh, today's lecture.